and welcome back to Brown Coat Reviews. I'm your host, Laura, and today we are doing an interview with 24x4, who is our local manga artist and writer who did Fist of Firenze. Now, you go by 24x4, but what's the significance in that particular signature? So, it's a common thing for uh, manga artists in Asia to be an, sort of anonymous. It's not like America where there's sort of this celebrity culture around um, making comics. So I wanted to try to keep up with that. And there's also some of that in America too, like guys like Art Germ and stuff, and like they're, they're really cool, and so I want to be like that. The significance of the numbers is 24 is one of my lucky numbers, and repeating things by four is also lucky for me. So it's just kind of like a wish for a successful career. <laughs> like I really want to do well. Now, of course, everyone is seeing you in a fantastically unique two dimension. <laughs> so is there a reason for covering your face? Do you have secret powers? You know, what are we showing? So it's the whole keeping anonymous thing. I actually saw, so there's this documentary series about making manga, which is just incredibly fascinating. It's called Monben. If you look it up on YouTube or Google, like the documentaries are just amazing. Uh, there's quite a few creators who ask that their faces not be shown and so they get around it by like doing the little animated face over their face thing. And it's it, it was very cute. And so I was like, I want to be like them too. <laughs> <laughs> so what inspired you to start drawing? Basically, I my earliest childhood memory is actually drawing. I just remember being like three years old and drawing on furniture uh, with markers. <laughs> so I feel like this was kind of like, in some ways, this is what I was always meant to do. It's been sort of something that I've done on and off. Like I had to quit drawing for school and I went through like a long phase of just hating everything that I did because I had to quit drawing for school. So my taste evolved more than my hand and um, it was just a horrible phase for me, but eventually like, I sort of got out of it and I decided, you know what, I'm going to like try to pursue drawing things that I love instead of drawing things that I think will make me money. And that's actually kind of worked out, kind of surprised, because before I was trying to draw like superhero stuff and it wasn't really happening. And then I went to a comic book convention and uh, I think it was Brian Stelfreeze, he told me, you need to try doing things that you actually like. <laughs> so I started doing that and then at the time I was also like, oh, this is never going to be a real career. Like I don't, this, this isn't a real job. And I always joke with my friends, I'm like Bilbo Baggins in the Shire. But the Shire is like being a corporate drone and it's like, uh, this, is, this is where I belong. I'm going to have a job with health insurance and it's gonna be fine. And then COVID happened and then everything exploded. And so it kind of forced me to re-examine my life. And then the Tezuka happened right when I was doing that. And so it just all kind of came together and now I'm, now I'm kind of a comic book artist. <laughs> have you always been interested in manga? And was there maybe a specific title or series that sort of drew you into that art style? Manga, I feel like with my generation, manga is sort of ever present. So it's not necessarily that there was a start because my generation, we had Pokemon, we had Sailor Moon, we had Dragon Ball. Like these are all just things that were sort of organically there. And so we all kind of grew up swimming in those waters. I, I will say though, Sailor Moon was my initial three-year-old. That was like my thing. And <laughs> recently my influences are Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. A lot of people will laugh because it's kind of like trashy shonen, but he did a collaboration with Gucci. It's not that trashy. And another big influence is Shinichi Sakamoto, who I would not recommend reading if you are under 18 or married. <laughs> He did this really edgy comic about the French Revolution, which is like deeply interesting. He does these historical retelling of Dracula that's just intensely edgy. It's some of the most beautiful art you'll see in your life. I try to draw like him in some ways. I'm not able to because he's in his 60s and I've lived less than half his life. <laughs> <laughs> is this the first uh, comic book or manga title that you've ever written and drawn? It is. It was a really big adventure to do. Previous to this, I was just sort of drawing it, doodling in the corners of my notes at work or in school. And I'd always wanted to make a comic, but I never was able to find the time or I was feeling really bad because like my taste evolved more than my hands. And then um, this kind of 
provided the opportunity to make it and I had to learn to make it in two months because my friends told me about the Tezuka competition a month after it was announced. Uh, everyone else had a month head start in front of me, so it was an adventure. <laughs> now, with these particular characters in this storyline, which we're going to talk about certainly more with time, is this going to be an ongoing series? Or do you have kind of multiple issues planned? What's the hope? My hope is to make this ongoing, and I don't know how long it'll be. I feel like it's probably going to end up being like a One Piece level. If you're into manga at all, like One Piece has set a world record. It passed a thousand issues or chapters. It's the longest continuous single creator run book. Some people will argue it's Savage Dragon. It is not. It is One Piece. It's probably going to end up like a One Piece level epic if I had my way. I do have ideas for like spin-offs I want to make in the future based on it. Following other historical figures, also doing martial arts in funny ways and related to the arts in Western culture and sort of carrying on the legacy of these characters. I also have like a million other series I want to make and it's my, my friends joke that I need an Andy Warhol factory to make them all. So maybe that'll end up happening one day, who knows? <laughs> Now, the story is based in Renaissance Italy, so what made you choose this particular time period? So I feel like this time period, there's a lot of echoes of the current year in a lot of ways. Back then, everyone was intensely political, very tunnel vision. People were sort of thinking they were seeing the big picture when maybe they weren't. They were being dragged down by like a lot of negativity and pettiness in a way. And back then, everybody was constantly trying to assassinate each other with poison or daggers. Today, we've got the internet to do that. Times change, but people don't in a lot of ways. And I feel like this was sort of a relevant time period to what's going on now. Now, in the back of the book, you give us this really great behind the scenes look at a lot of the research that you did for the story and the characters. Was there something about Pope Pius, Leonardo da Vinci, Lorenzo de' Medici that drew you into these historic figures? So I really wanted to tell a story about Leonardo doing Kung Fu. So it came from a conversation that I had with my dad where we were talking about being tired of sort of irony culture. At the time, like Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, like, all this stuff was happening and it was, okay, we get it, it's goofy, it's ironic, ha ha ha. I'm really inspired by th movies like Napoleon Dynamite that are considered to be post-irony. Me and my dad were like, what if we just do that, but with complete sincerity? And so that's kind of what this ended up being in a lot of ways. Like, I just wanted to tell a story about Leonardo doing Kung Fu, but like play it completely straight. <laughs> At the time, he also like, he needed sort of a supporting character and we were like, who can be the Alfred? We were thinking of like other sort of character, other, it's, they're not characters, they're real people, but they're also kind of characters because they're, they're very colorful people of the time. Lorenzo de' Medici was, li was also living in Florence and he was also a teenager, so it sort of seemed like, oh, like what if they met? Who knows, they, they could have. A lot of this is just sort of playing on like, what well, we just don't know. <laughs> I guess with the story of the popes and everything that's going on in this, I found it really interesting that you've sort of got this story about these two political figures because that's ultimately kind of what popes were back then. They were sort of, they were political figures who are also conflated with divinity and it, I thought it was really interesting because we're also sort of seeing echoes of that right now where people are just sort of taking politics entirely too seriously in a lot of ways. People are kind of ascribing a inflated sense of importance to these things, almost like how people were back then. Would you consider this more of a historical story, kind of a truthful telling, or are you sticking more with the historical fiction where it's got some hints of history and then you're having some fun with some kung fu? A lot of it is very historical, except for the parts that totally aren't. Um, and <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Some of my friends said that they had trouble reading it the first time and they needed to read it like a second or a third time because the first time they were reading it, they were trying to figure out where the history started and ended. But that's kind of not what the intent was. The intent was just to like have a fun ride and then maybe come out of it having learned a few things. And that's part of the reason why I included the, um, the research section at the end. So you can sort of see what is real to an extent. I mean, they probably didn't do Kung Fu, or we, I don't know, maybe they did do Kung Fu, we just don't know. 
We just don't know any of this. <laughs> now, in this book, you have a lot of different languages sort of thrown in there. So you have obviously English, but then you have Italian and you have Latin. So do yes. you have a background in different languages or is there other reasons that you wanted to include all these different languages together? It's largely just for flavor. <laughs> I really want the setting to feel realistic. That's really important to me because I think a lot of historicals these days in comics, they don't really go all in. I'm trying to go all in on that. We're, we're getting the flavor text, we're getting everything. It's just also kind of fun. I've got Italian friends and they're telling me how to make them move their hand, things that they can say. And a lot of this was me learning about things and then me trying to help you learn about things as readers. <laughs> That's very cool. The 100th Tezuka. Now, why is it so important that this one was different to include artists from other countries? This one was really cool because they opened it up internationally. And I think part of the reason why might be as much as we feel in America that manga is doing amazing, in Japan, there's sort of a feeling that maybe things might not continue forever in this upward direction. Shonen Jump is actually going to be ending a few of their most iconic series soon. One Piece, I believe he said he's ending it within like the next 10 years or something like that. And One Piece is like the, the biggest one. They've ended Promised Neverland and a few other ones recently. So now there's sort of a shortage. And from what I recall, there hasn't been like a grand prize winner for the closed off Japanese Tezuka for a few years now, which is extremely unusual. It seems that Japan might be looking outside to see if there's more talent out in the wide world. And it's pretty exciting because up until now, a lot of people believe that you can only make manga if you're Asian and especially Japanese. But recently it's widened up to Asian in general with Webtoon being popular, which I'm grateful for because I'm Asian. But at the same time, there's a lot of people of other ethnicities who are making manga and it's like, they should have a chance too because they're also really talented and I feel like this is sort of giving everybody a chance. The Tezuka sort of unlocks that in everybody and it's really exciting. Now the Tezuka is a unique competition because there are some years that there's no winner or there may not be a first or second place winner. Why is that? In Japan, if you are the best out of a group of people who are not great, they still don't award you the grand prize. It's not like America in that sense. They only give you the grand prize if they feel that you are deserving of the grand prize. So you, you sometimes end up with these competitions where there's only like a third prize winner or something like that. And it's, it's extremely confusing, but that seems to be how it works. Now, your title is still in the top 400 out of like thousands of different manga titles that were entered into the Tezuka, which is amazing. But yours, you consider it more of a sleeper hit. Why do you say that? Basically, I submitted it the day before the due date. So everybody submitted on the due date <laughs> for the most part, and I got totally lost in the shuffle. However, a lot of other people's books, their, their reader ship numbers have stayed stable throughout this almost year. Meanwhile, my book has been steadily growing in readers. It started like all the way down at page 35 in popularity, and now it's finally up in the single digits, up in eight or nine, I think now, which is really exciting. I'm hoping it only increases from here in web reading and then also in physical reading too. <laughs> Obviously, we have issue number one that's available. When will we expect issue number two? So. This is sort of more of a pilot than an issue one. In Japan, a lot of the time, before a series is properly released, they'll have a one-shot sort of pilot-y type of thing that gives readers a chance to sort of experience the universe and experience the characters and the premise of the story. Shonen Jump works based a lot based on reader surveys. It's not like America where people are always guessing. No, they know because people will tell them. So a lot of the time readers will be like, yeah, I like this one shot. This is really cool. Can you make more of it? And then at that point they, they do. So I'm sort of treating this in the same way. So far it's done way better than I thought it would. So, so I think I'm going to turn this into a full series. They call these Tonkobons. I'm going to try to have a Tonkobon. So hopefully this winter, we're, we're going to see if I can work that fast. It'll be an adventure. 
I feel like I can get it done though because I've been getting faster recently. In the meantime though, I also have a few other projects and I have a new competition book that I'm working on this summer. So is that another comic book that you're working on for the other competition? Yes, it's a different sort of pilot thing and if people like it enough then I'm probably going to turn that into a series too and I'm going to have two series and that's going to be an adventure. The other one is about post-apocalyptic Floridian street fishing. That's awesome. So <laughs> it, the, the climate change apocalypse has occurred and nobody in Florida really cares. It's just another day in Florida. So what are you going to do? You're just going to go fishing in those rising sea levels. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, your uh, Fist of Firenze is available here at Ultimate Comics Raleigh. I've seen it over at Play for Life Comics. Mm -hmm. What kind of shops are, is it available at, you know, here in the Raleigh area? And then where can people who are not locally get the book? It's a, available at a lot of places in the Raleigh area. Um, I actually have a Google Maps chart. It's a lot. I'm basically sort of going around and just asking shops and whoever will take it will take it. And so far I've been very thankful. It's been quite a few people. So if basically if it's a shop that stocks a little bit of manga, you, it's probably going to be there. It's also in Virginia and it's going to be in DC soon enough, hopefully. It's just the traffic up there is very scary. A way that you can obtain it is I'm actually starting up my own publishing company because before COVID, I used to work in publishing in New York City. So I figured why not use that experience to try to start something new? I have a publishing company. It's called May Apple Magazine. We're going to be doing sort of a Shonen Jump type of thing eventually where we have like monthly anthologies of really cool manga titles. Like I'm really excited for it. everybody's insanely talented insanely professional. We're all meeting our deadlines. It's going to go good. We've got a website on the website. We've got like an email address listed. We've got things like that. So if you send an email to us, then I will make sure that your local comic shop gets copies. We're also working with, it's a weird name, Rat Nest Sticker Company. <laughs> and they also do comic book distribution. They're going to hopefully be working with me on a second printing. They're based on the West Coast, so then I could easily get books over there and to the Midwest as well, if, if that works out. I'm, I, th I th feel like it would. I hung out with them yesterday and they were like, yeah, let's go for it. Is there anything else that you wanted to tell people about, whether it's Vista Firenze, your upcoming manga title, your upcoming publishing company, anything else that you want people to know about before we kind of wrap up? Oh, gosh. There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the big thing is I'm just super excited that uh, and thankful that this book has managed to gain some traction. I get like really emotional about it sometimes when this first got printed and I saw like, a physical copy of it. Like I cried in my car for a while. I was like, oh my God, this thing that I spent so much time on, I spent two months working 14 hours a day on this thing. And now it's a thing that I'm holding. I still can't believe that people are reading it and they like it. I really want my next books to be good. I, I, an uphill trend from here. I'm going to work really hard to make everything really good. I really hope everybody will come along with me for this journey. I really hope people will also come along with my other creators too, because they're also really, really talented. And I'm so proud of everybody. I'm just very positive about everything. <laughs> Thank you, of course, for all of your time. Down in the description box, I will have her email address, uh, the website, everything that you need to be able to get in touch with 24 by 4. And of course, if you have any additional questions for her, just put it down in the comments and I will make sure it gets to her. And I really, really appreciate your time. This has been Thanks. wonderful. And I look forward to doing another interview when your next title is released. Oh my God, that would be <laughs> great. Thank you. Thank you so much.